This is a mechanism of disease map for sympathomimetic toxidrome. I'll be talking about the etiology of this toxidrome, the central pathophysiology, as well as the many manifestations over various organ systems for sympathomimetic toxidrome. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color coded according to this legend that you see here in the top right. Let's go ahead and clear all these boxes and repopulate them one by one as we talk through the mechanism of disease for sympathomimetic toxidrome. First, let's start off with the central pathophysiology. This toxidrome happens when you have a sudden and dramatic increase in catecholamine activity. Now, two of the most prominent catecholamines are epinephrine and norepinephrine, also called adrenaline and noradrenaline. And all of these catecholamines serve to increase the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. When this happens, there are four main receptors at play. These are called the adrenergic receptors. There's alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2, and they all have slightly different downstream effects. We'll get to all of them um, when we talk about manifestations, and we'll see how the many drugs that cause sympathomimetic toxidrome hit different receptors. Some of them hit one more than the other. Some of them hit them all pretty equally. We'll see all of that when we have all of the boxes laid out. But for now, know that there are four receptors and they have slightly different downstream effects. Working our way back to the etiology of the toxidrome, you can either have direct catecholamine activity, that's when you have a molecule that directly hits the active site of the receptor, or you can have indirect catecholamine activity. That's where you're still increasing the catecholamine activity, you're still promoting the sympathetic nervous system, but you're doing it in a place other than the active site of these receptors. These are how you can have indirect catecholamine activity. You can be an indirect agonist to these receptors, for instance. So instead of hitting your beta-2 receptor at the active site, you can somehow modify it at a separate site, an axillary site, where you're making it more sensitive to molecules that hit it at the active site. You could be a reuptake inhibitor. An example of this is that if you have epinephrine at a synapse, you can uh, prevent the reuptake of, ep of epinephrine so that it's present in the synapse longer and able to exert its active effect for a longer period of time. You can also release catecholamines from other parts of the body, for instance, from the adrenal gland, um, and that, that would be an indirect activation of catecholamine activity. So um, slightly different from the direct catecholamine activity, but you can see that these arrows go to the same central box, and the end effect is that you increase sympathetic nervous system activities. These drugs here tend to be drugs of abuse. Um, they include amphetamines or derivatives of amphetamines, which might include some ADHD drugs, cocaine, um, and ephedrine, which includes pseudephedrine. So amphetamines do all of these things. They're indirect agonists, they are reuptake inhibitors, and they release um, catecholamines directly. Um, cocaine does the first two on this list. Cocaine is an indirect agonist for the adrenergic receptors, and it's also a reuptake inhibitor. Ephedrine and pseudoephedrine does the first and the third. Um, ephedrine is an indirect agonist and it also releases catecholamines. So it'll release your endogenous epinephrine and norepinephrine, but it itself does not act exactly like epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now let's talk about the etiologies of direct catecholamine activity. There are several medications that are given. These medications tend to be um, given by providers, say maybe in an ICU or in a surgical setting. Um, they might also be given as outpatient meds as well. Um, phenylephrine is mostly an alpha agonist. Norepinephrine is an alpha more than a beta agonist. Epinephrine hits all of the receptors, tends to favor beta receptors at low doses, alpha receptors at high doses. Dopamine hits these dopamine receptors that act similarly um, to the alpha and beta receptors listed here, but it also has some beta and alpha at uh, low and high doses, respectively. So it has chronotropic effects and vasoconstrictive effects at low and high doses, respectively. Midodrine hits alpha-1 receptor exclusively. Methyl dopa, clonidine, and guafacine hit alpha-2 receptors exclusively. Dobutamine primarily hits beta receptors, um, specifically beta-1. Albuterol, salmeterol, fometerol, and terbutaline, these are usually used in like alpha, or sorry, in, uh, in asthma treatment. These are beta agonists, beta-2 more than beta-1. 
isoproteranol also hits the beta receptors pretty equally, beta 1 equal to beta 2. So you can have an overdose of these. Um, it can be an iatrogenic overdose, or if the drugs are given in the outpatient setting, the patient might be taking too much of what they're prescribed, and that would cause an increase in direct catecholamine activity and can trigger a sympathomimetic toxidrome. There are other ways to get direct catecholamine activity in the body that doesn't come from medication. So we'll start to see some different colors here besides the green that we've seen so far. This is a rare cause, but a pheochromocytoma is a medullary tumor of the adrenal glands. This specifically secretes epinephrine, norepinephrine, other catecholamines from the gland itself. And that can, of course, directly increase your sympathetic nervous system that way. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is known to cause direct catecholamine effects. This can be in the case of a, of a head trauma, for instance, where you have somebody take a, a blunt injury to the head that causes them to bleed. When they have bleed in the subarachnoid space, that blood then irritates the meninges and causes the release of catecholamines, which might trigger a sympathomimetic toxidrome. Lastly on this list, if you are eating a high tyramine diet in a patient taking monoamine oxidase inhibitors, that can precipitate a hypertensive crisis. This happens because tyramine displaces the stored catecholamines from synaptic vesicles. So when those catecholamines are displaced, they'll directly um, hit these receptors and cause a sympathomimetic toxidrome, with the more prominent symptom being hypertension. Now, the high tyramine diet includes foods like wine and aged cheeses and chocolate and cured meats. And these monoamine oxidase inhibitors are um, traditionally used for depression, but they're not used um, all that commonly anymore because they do have these side effects and we have better depression medications these days. So that's the etiology of sympathomimetic toxidrome. Mostly drugs, um, some iatrogenic, some drugs of abuse, but there are some other etiologies that are worth knowing as well. Now let's go into the manifestations, and as I mentioned earlier, we'll organize these according to um, the receptor type as best as we can. Let's start with the alpha-1 receptor. This receptor does many things. It causes contraction of the bladder neck, and that might manifest as urinary retention. It also causes peripheral vasoconstriction in your vasculature. This can cause hypertension throughout the body, um, and when you have hypertension like that, it can cause a reflex bradycardia. So we'll say that the hypertension and the vasoconstriction in the periphery can cause a reflex bradycardia. You can have an increase in blood pressure and a drop in your heart rate. This vasoconstriction can also cause ischemia um, in the peripheries, mostly in the fingers and toes. This is particularly severe in patients that are hypovolemic. So if you have low blood volume and you're constricting your blood vessels going to your fingers and toes, your fingers and toes might not get enough blood at all, they might not get oxygen, that's ischemia, and over a long period of time that can cause necrosis or death of the tissues in your fingers and toes. Alpha-1 activity also cause med causes medriasis. This is dilation of your pupil, so they'll have very large pupils, and also causes piloerection as well. Let's skip down to beta-1 activity. Um, alpha-2 is a little unique. We'll save that one for last. Beta-1 receptors cause tachycardia and arrhythmias. These are mostly localized on the heart, whereas these are uh, prominently characterized outside of the heart. So beta-1 causes tachycardia and arrhythmias. These two conditions, tachycardias and arrhythmias, can predispose the patient to angina, um, as it might increase demand for um, oxygen inside the heart muscle, and in severe cases, that can cause myocardial infarctions. Patients that are predisposed to this are those that have uh, coronary vascular disease or coronary artery disease. So um, you, you might trigger a heart attack in a patient who has had problems with their, with their arteries in the past, and that beta-1 activity is crucial to that pathophysiology here. Beta-2 activity causes some more nonspecific symptoms. This includes tremors, agitation, insomnia, and diaphoresis, or sweating. It also causes some metabolic syndromes, uh, some metabolic, like I guess, labs, hyperglycemia, and hypokalemia in this case. And beta-2 receptors also cause vasodilation, which can result in hypotension in this case. And this kind of has the opposite effect of what we saw up here where hypertension caused reflex bradycardia. In this case, we have hypotension that causes reflex tachycardia. So of course, you won't have both of these at the same time, and it'll largely depend on the etiology 
of the toxidrome. If you have a drug that primarily hits the beta-2 receptor, you're more likely to have hypotension with tachycardia. If you have a drug that more prominently hits the alpha-1 receptor, like phenylephrine, first one on this list, for instance, that might cause hypertension and reflex bradycardia. So that kind of emphasizes how these differences in manifestations can help you um, direct your etiology, direct your diagnosis toward a certain drug or a certain um, drug of abuse down here. There are some more nonspecific syndromes um, that just result from increasing the activity of your sympathetic nervous system. This includes seizures, paranoia, delusions, and hyperactive bowel. This last one, hyperactive bowel, is particularly helpful to remember because it helps you differentiate sympathomimetic toxidrome from anticholinergic syndrome. Anticholinergic syndrome also causes a lot of the things you see here, medriasis, the, uh, um, some of the agitation, the tremors, uh, maybe the urinary retention and the bloating. Um, but the key difference is that sympathomimetic toxidrome will have hyperactive bowels, whereas anticholinergic syndrome will have uh, hypoactive bowels, will have low or no bowel sounds. So that's a key difference there as well. Lastly, let's talk about the alpha-2 agonist and its effects. The alpha-2 agonists typically cause symptoms from sympatholytic effects. This means that the drug that's hitting the alpha-2 receptor is doing that, but it's also blocking other drugs from hitting these other receptors, from hitting alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2. So these, you'll notice, are slightly different effects, but um, it's mostly the opposite of what we've seen on this slide so far. So the alpha-2 agonists can cause CNS depression, respiratory depression, bradycardia, hypotension, and meiosis, or pinpoint pupils. An example of a drug that's a strong alpha-2 agonist is clonidine, and that can cause these symptoms when you overdose on clonidine. This has been a mechanism of disease for sympathomimetic toxidrome. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.